welcome everybody um, to the um, LFX Mentorship Showcase. This is segment three, and we have several um, mentees that are going to be sharing their experiences with you all. Um, let's talk a little bit about the beginner's problem. And we all struggle with where do we start whenever we embark on a new journey, something new field that we want to learn, new project, and, and so on. So this is a not an unique problem. Uh, we all face this problem. And the first thing really that gets us all is um, what? What do we want to do? What are we passionate about? What do we enjoy doing? And which open source project to pick from? Um, as we have several uh, in different areas. And once we figure that out, we do our research and we figure that out, uh, the next problem we face is the how. How do we get started in a, a, with our learning? And also, how do we break into uh, the community? And the code base looks complex always. And the community looks intimidating and daunting. And what's, where is the best place to start learning? So these are all the questions we all face. And once we figure a little bit out of that, out of that and where do we find resources to learn? Because that's one of the obstacles. Um, and then comes the question, who can we turn to for help? Who can help us with our questions? Who can we reach out to? So we all face this what, how, where, and who questions. And we at the Linux Foundation, we do understand these are obstacles for new developers. We provide uh, resources for you. Um, the, the site you see here, uh, plan your learning paths. You can do that at the LF training site. You can go um, look at the explore pathways and figure out what you want to, what kind of technology and fields you want to look at. And you can do the, all that planning and research as well. There are several free training classes that you can take um, to get a feel for what you would like to do. Um, once you've done that and you kind of identified which area you want to be in, you can um, benefit from taking uh, looking at the webinars and uh, learning from the, our webinar series. We have several webinars um, already archived. You can go take a look at them. They cover a wide range of technologies, anywhere from debugging to open source methodologies and uh, fuzzing, static analysis, and so on. There is a wealth of knowledge there, and some of them are cardinal ones as well. Once you have done that, you can explore mentorships. And we offer several mentorships. Uh, part-time, full-time options, and paid and unpaid, and so on. And once you have done that, we also connect you with um, people looking for talent. That's the event we are in right now, a Mentorship Showcase. And I'll leave you with um, um, this slide with lots of resources on where to find information. And uh, keep in mind that we do, at LF, we do rec uh, recognize that um, access to resources is a barrier for people and equity, equitable uh, access. So we try to provide resources for everybody and we welcome everybody, whether you are a student or you are a career uh, change, um, you're looking to change careers and explore new uh, career options. We provide all of that to you. And part-time mentorships, webinars, training resources. And we do all of that, keeping in mind that um, not uh, you are balancing a lot of people are balancing work life uh, uh, situations for learning and growth um, and and we just did a survey we are continuing to look at what we can improve what kind of resources we can provide um, and fine tuning our mentorship programs so we have done a um, survey recently of all our graduates and we have uh, we have a report out check that out um, just out a couple of days ago. Okay, so with that, um, uh, we can, I'll hand this off to uh, Takumi uh, to share his experiences with uh, the mentorship. Okay.
Okay. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Takumi Hiroka. Today, I'm going to talk about the experience of LFX Risk Five mentorship, with the title "Opening the Door to the Open Source Software Through the Open Brass Project." I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Tokyo. My research topic interests are computer architecture and compilers. In my research, I spend a lot of time dealing with RISC-V and LLVM technologies. So I'm very interested in systems programming, including them. Therefore, I found the Open Brass project so appearing and decided to join it. After being selected as a mentee, I'm working on improving Open Brass. Now I will give a brief description of the project I worked on Open Brass. Open Brass is optimized Brass library. Brass stands for basic linear algebra subprograms. Brass has three levels computations. Level one is about vector scalar, and level two is about matrix vector, and level three is about matrix matrix. Open Brass is optimized for its processor to achieve high performance in those computations. But level three, Open Brass kernel didn't support Risk Five Vector version one point zero, so I was trying to implement it. Then I will now give a brief description of the project I worked on Open Brass. Open Brass uses blocking and packing techniques to speed up processing by using registers and caches as efficiently as possible. You can see this in the figure. Blocking is done with register and cache size awareness in order to increase register and cache utilization and reduce access to main memory as much as possible. Parking techniques also arrange data in a contiguous manner in memory, uh, which simplifies a memory access pattern and reduces the cache miss rate. These are the goals I like to achieve through this project. First, I want to contribute to Open Blast repository. I've never contributed to OSS before, but I've always wanted to do so. Uh, this is because uh, it is very attractive to develop software used by many people. And because I can deepen my knowledge of the area, improve my and improve my coding skills. Second, I want to deepen my understanding of risk five related technologies. Although I have had some exposure to risk five technology, uh, I know that the scope of risk five technology is broad and there's still, there are still areas that I'm unaware of. Therefore, I'd like to further push my risk pipe technology through working on this project. Third, I want to get used to coding large scale software. Large scale software is often difficult to understand where to start, how classes relate to each other, and what kind of processing is performed. Therefore, through this project, I'd like to get used to working with large-scale software. From now, I'll talk about uh, what I learned through this mentorship. First of all, it gave me a better understanding of RISC-V technology. First, my PC is equipped with a processor for x86, so I needed to prepare a compiler for RISC-V in, in order to cross-compile. Uh, the two most famous compilers are Clang and GCC, each of which has subtle differences, and I use them for outputting risk five assembly code. Throughout using both compilers, I got to be able to understand the differences between them. Furthermore, I did not have I did not have an actual risk five machine, and risk five pieces are already available on the market, so performance measurement had to be done by simulation. So I used uh, I used simulator software such as Spike and QM, and understood their usage. Also, since I dealt with risc five vector extension this time, I gained a deep uh, I gained a deep understanding of the specification of it. I also learned the importance of breaking difficult tasks into smaller, simpler tasks. 
In the beginning, I was very nervous about the project to contribute to Open Brass because I did not know how to accomplish it. However, my mentor signed us detailed steps to accomplish our goals, and I was able to move forward without feeling too much difficulty. Specifically, I first followed the tutorial to run the elemental technologies of OpenBrass by optimizing GMM for x86. Since I can visualize the results in graphs, it, is, uh, it was easy to see the effect of uh, optimization on performance. Next, I created an environment capable of executing risk 5 vector instructions. Specifically, I prepared a compiler, a simulator, and a proxy kernel. Proxy kernel is a set of binaries necessary to run the simulator. It's easy to prepare a general instruction set such as arbo 64 im uh, but uh, the extensions are rather recent extension and the tool chain around them is either uh, newly developed or in the middle of development. So I couldn't find an article that, uh, success, that successfully prepared an environment for vector extensions. So I had to check the documentation and issues to build. And I had a hard time using the correct version of vector extensions and the correct repository branch. So I decided to write and post a technical blog on how to build the environment. Third, I wrote a program using RISC V vector inter E6 to compute GMM using a 4x4 kernel. Here, I was able to familiarize myself with the RISC V vector instructions to some extent. Finally, I wrote a code to compute GMM using inline assembly of risk v vector instructions. At this point, uh, the project is still in progress, uh, and I think it will finally enter the stage of contributing to the open browse repository. What I have also run through this project is that it's not difficult to contribute to OSS. In fact, I've, I've not yet contribute to OpenBrass repository, but considering that I'm at the stage where I can do so in a short time, if we take small steps like the one I set in a behold slide and build them up little by little, everyone can contribute to OSS. So if you are hesitant to contribute to OSS, I encourage you to take the branch. I also contribute to I also continue to contribute not only OpenBrass, but also various OSS from now on. In this slide, I'd like to thank both of the two persons for the support throughout this mentorship. First, I'd like to thank mentor Siani. Uh, he gave us a pro appropriate assignment and guided us on our way to becoming contributors. He also followed up with us when we had technical difficulties. Also, thanks to Marazan, he is another mentee and worked with me on the project with enthusiasm. He too gave me technical advice when I had programs and helped me uh, when I have what I couldn't understand in the meeting because of poorness of my English skills. Finally, I uh, I like to talk about my future plans. First of all, uh, I'll continue to study and develop open brass even after this mentorship is over. With the rise of machine running, uh, material cooperation will become more important. And the performance of linear algebra libraries such as open brass will also, more, also become more important. Next, I will be more active in OSS activities. Through this project, I have deepened my understanding of Risk Five, and I have always been I have always been interested in compiler technologies, uh, especially LLVM. So I like to work on OSS related to those technologies. Also, I'm currently a senior in a senior in college and will be entering graduate school in the spring of this year, and I'm looking for an internship. 
I would like to express remote internship at an overseas companies to make the most of this experience of working on a project with people from overseas. This is my email address and GitHub account. If you are interested in me, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Hello, uh, I hope I'm audible. If anyone could just quickly confirm this thing. Okay, sure. So, hi everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or good night, depending on the place you're currently living. I am Anubhav, and I'm going to talk about my experience as Linux Foundation mentee for the spring of 2022. So a little bit of instruction of mine, who am I? My name is Anubhav Chaudhary and I'm currently an intern at Veritas. I'm a CS undergraduate from IIIT Bhuvaneshwar. I love fiddling around with code and exploring stuff around. I've contributed to some open source projects before also, like Calamaris, the system installer. And yeah, you can Google me by this name, Dipra447. I'm quite famous, not really. So let's start. So I was interning under uh, Linux Foundation for this, uh, uh, under this organization called CNCF. So what's CNCF? CNCF is a nonprofit organization founded by the Linux Foundation in year 2015 with the goal of uh, promoting the adoption of cloud native technologies and methodologies and under cncf also there is there are various projects mostly there is kubernetes there is nv there is there are pixie so i was contributing to this project called pixie what is pixie pixie is an observationality tool for kubernetes and uh, it works without uh, having any changes to the main code base so Let's see a bit more what Pixie. So what Pixie allows you to do is it lets you audit your uh, Kubernetes environment. It makes you, uh, it, it allows you to uh, see different events. It allows you to monitor different stuff and it also allows you to log different stuff uh, that's going around in a Kubernetes application. A little bit about my project. So, okay. So when when we moved from this monolithic uh, monolithic kind of structure of our and uh, of our applications to more of microservices environment, the number of uh, messages going around with these between these services increased drastically, very exponentially. So naturally, there should be some way to to look around these messages uh, that are going between different services. And of course, messages requires protocols, protocols, basically rules. So there are different protocols available for uh, uh, different uh, microservices to talk between them. There are HTTP protocols, there are JRPC protocols, etc. What my goal for this project was, it was to add uh, support for automatic tracing and parsing of AMQP protocol. So Pixie uh, already had support for various protocols like uh, HTTP, it had for Redis, etc. And uh, what was required at that time was to implement support for AMQP. What's AMQP? AMQP is uh, the full form of AMQP is Advanced Message Queuing Protocol. It's an open standard application layer protocol for message-oriented middlewares. Uh, it's very similar to something if you have heard MQTT. 
and uh, what I had to do is implement different type of uh, uh, implement parsing of different types of messages of AMQP version 09, 0.9.1. There are different versions of AMQP available, but I have to work on this. So proceeding further. Let's see how my three months went. And there is a bit of story and excitement really around everything. So I'd be sharing that. Uh, so first of all, selection. My selection was, uh, it was around the end of Feb. I was, uh, at this time I was learning about uh, networking in general. I was highly interested in networking and uh, I just came, uh, came through this uh, mentorship uh, page on Linux Foundation mentorship website uh, where Pixie was mentioning something to uh, implement different, uh, a protocol, Mongo. I was somewhat familiar with MongoDB. So I tried uh, creating a demo uh, parser myself. Then we came to uh, the, the Pixie uh, Slack page and I told my mentor that I've done this and that. And he just loved the parser that I made. I was uh, selected after a few days. Then one of the biggest step of uh, these three months was setting up dev, a dev environment. So uh, like Pixie works with Kubernetes applications and for an undergraduate like Kubernetes itself, I guess is somewhat tough. So I, I sat up my dev environment in, uh, uh, in First of all, I tried to set up this environment on my local laptop, but it was way tough. Then there, there are Docker based dev environment, which was, which I wasn't familiar with beforehand. So it was a great learning that, yeah, you can develop stuff around in Docker also. Anyway, then next was reading Redis protocol. Okay. So there, there might be much confusion around Initially, that, that was Mongo. Now I'm read, reading Redis specs. And finally, I would implement AMQP protocol. So yeah, protocols are uh, like, you should get a sense how protocols work. And then you can implement various protocols all around. And that's, I guess, is universal for all computer science. You get sense around some things, and then you proceed further with specifics. So yeah, Redis was easy to understand. It has shorter specs, so I gave a red, uh, I gave a reading to Redis protocol first of all. Then I read about AMQP protocol, and if you have uh, observed, like it's a lot of reading. So I guess for almost 45 days out of 90 days, I was reading stuff. I was just learning stuff. Then there was time for implementation. I started implementing uh, various messages, various passing techniques in C++ in the, in the Pixie environment. It was kind of, I guess, tough thing like C++. I was somewhat familiar with C++, but not with the development C++, but my mentors really helped me a lot. Uh, I would really like to thank them. And finally, there was testing involved. So testing was also kind of different. Like I was get, uh, I manually tested a lot of data. I was getting binary strings and I was manually trying to parse them by myself and then seeing if my, if my application, if my uh, parser was giving the same result or not. So what I learned, I learned a lot about AMQP. I learned a lot about Docker, like, Really, really, Docker was one of the great things that I learned. C++, yeah, of course, C++. I was programming in C++, so I learned a lot of programming techniques. Build tools, I use Bazel for building. So I learned a lot about build tools. And Kubernetes in general, yeah. So X is dependent on Kubernetes, so Kubernetes in general. But the main thing that I learned was computer science. Uh, really, this uh, 
mentorship program helped me a lot understand the deep deep things of computer science so if anyone is thinking about joining uh, this mentorship program applying for mentorship program, i would say it's the it's one of my best decisions of life uh then these two people are were my mentors yak siang and uh, omit so i would personally like to thank them a lot like uh, they are kind of very senior people they are principal software engineers and the founding members of pixi but they held me around in almost every corner of my project so even very small things i was getting uh, some issues in build and all they were manually helping me a lot especially zong he was my uh, my uh, he was my main mentor so he helped me a lot and yeah that's pretty much about it uh, you can uh, i go by this name again dipro447 you can just google me around on twitter you can follow me on @dreadsick5 and you can message me uh, here at dipro447 about my future aspirations i would say uh, if you have an opportunity for me let me know i might be interested and uh, i would i would always be contributing to open source it's one of my main loves thanks a lot for hearing me Hey everyone I am Sundipon Panda and today I will be sharing with you my experience of working as a mentee to improve the supply chain security of Cilium as part of the Linux Foundation mentorship program so let's get started a little bit about me I am a senior undergraduate majoring in information technology at Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad University of Technology in India I started my journey in open source as a mentee in the Kubernetes community where I am now a member I am passionate about open source and cloud native technologies Now let's get a quick overview of the project Cilium is a software defined networking and network security solution for cloud native applications. It provides visibility and security for applications running on Kubernetes using an open source high performance model that is simple to set up and configure. Now let me share with you my project goals. I improve improved the security posture of cilium family's open source projects as part of the linux foundation mentorship program this include implementing container image signing generating software bill of materials and bringing the clo monitor score of cilium to 100% as you can see after the project completion we are generating a software bill of materials and signing the container images and the sbom images using cosign and we have achieved a clo monitor score of 100% now let me share with you the key takeaways of my mentorship experience at cilium while working on the project i came to know about the importance of container security and signing container images and how it provides a means of verifying the integrity of the images which ensures that only trusted images are deployed in production signed images also help to protect against malicious actors 
who may try to modify or replace the images with malicious code. But why is keyless better than conventional signing? It is so because it eliminates the need for manual key management and reduces the risk of maliciously signed images being deployed into production. Keyless signing also simplifies the process of securely managing large numbers of container images as there is no need to maintain a key per image. And that's why we implemented con keyless container image signing in Cilium. I also came to know the importance of generating software bill of materials while working on the Cilium project. It allows organizations to have visibility and control over the components used in their applications and this helps organizations ensure that they are using secure and reliable components as well as reducing the risks of security vulnerabilities or compliance issues. You might remember me mentioning that Cilium attained the CLO monitor score of 100%. But what is CLO monitor? It is a tool that periodically checks open source projects repositories to verify they meet certain project health best practices now let me introduce you to my mentors and let me share with you how we worked together my mentors andre martins Natalia Reka Ivanko and Jed Salazar played an pivotal role in my successful graduation from the Linux Foundation Mentorship Program. They played a pivotal role by providing me with valuable guidance and feedback throughout the entire project development process. This included helping me to refine my ideas and develop an achievable plan for completing the project. They offered moral support and encouragement throughout the entire time I was working on the project. Their positive attitude kept me motivated even when things got tough or I felt overwhelmed by the task ahead of me. Finally, they provided technical advice resources and connections that enabled me to complete the project successfully. Their constant support and dedication to helping me reach my goals made all the difference in my successful graduation from the Linux Foundation Mentorship Program. We worked together by scheduling weekly check-ins to review progress, blockers and upcoming tasks communicating via Slack to discuss issues and get feedback, and coordinating with folks from the Kubernetes and Sigstore community. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the awesome community of developers at Cilium, Kubernetes and Sigstore for their valuable input and helping us implement the Kubernetes bomb tool used to generate software bill of materials and the Sigstore's cosine tool used in signing the container images. So what's next? I plan to utilize my skills in coding and development to create open source applications that serve a greater purpose become a mentor for new students interested in open source and helping them guide through the processes of getting started. Join or even start an organization or group of students devoted to furthering the advancement of open source technology in both education and industry and attend conferences, workshops, hackathons and other events related to open source software 
in order to stay informed on the latest developments and trends within the field. With that, I will wrap up the session. Thank you so much for joining. I would like to take a moment to thank my mentors who have helped me throughout my term. Your guidance and support has been invaluable and I am grateful for all the knowledge you have shared with me. Finally, I would like to thank the Linux Foundation for organizing and hosting this showcase and giving me the opportunity to build relationships with the open source communities that will last far beyond this program. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to LFX Mentorship Showcase 2023. A brief introduction about myself. My name is Oshi Gupta and I have been LFX mentee in spring 2022 for CNCF Kiwano project. Currently, I am working as a DevOps engineer and technical writer at Cloudiga Technologies and I am also a CK certified. And right now, I am uh, currently connecting with you from Indoor, India. A quick overview about Kiwano. So, Kiwano is a Greek word which means to govern and Kiwano is a policy engine especially designed for Kubernetes which helps in managing the policies as the uh, Kubernetes resources and it is also a incub uh, incubating project under CNCF. So as a part of my mentorship, uh, I have been working to, uh, to write test cases for Kiwano policies. Uh, basically, I have to improve the test coverage for the Kiwano muted and validated policies and I have to uh, write uh, and include more test cases uh, in both positive and negative scenarios for Kiwano validated and muted policies. So while working uh, during this mentorship, I have been uh, working towards Kiwano CLI commands, that is Kiwano apply and Kiwano test commands, and to understand how uh, they are working. I have also like uh, worked uh, towards understanding about how to write Kiwano policies like how to define rules under those policies, how to uh, write about resource selection of the Kubernetes, how uh, validate and muted policies work and how they are uh, validating and mutating the Kubernetes resources. Also, I understand how uh, you can manage the uh, external Kubernetes resources such as uh, config maps and Kubernetes secrets. Uh, I um, mostly learn about the Kubernetes, uh, the Kiwano policies while uh, applying on it uh, uh, the Kubernetes cluster and understanding it as an external user. I uh, write test cases and then uh, in the muted policies how the patch resources are like uh, getting generated and how you can validate uh, in the Kiwano policy engine. That also I learned it. So. Uh, at the last of my mentorship, I have created two PRs uh, separately for my uh, the to write test cases for Kiwano policies and simultaneously for uh, validate uh, Kiwano policies also. During this uh, mentorship, I have been like uh, worked and learned about Kiwano policy engine, how dynamic admission control works in the Kubernetes, how you can valid uh, mutate and validate the resources. Uh, various, uh, a deep understanding of various Kubernetes resources also. And I've also developed a deep understanding of YAML and Gemspath, which is a JSON query language used in Kiwano policy engine. Along with it, I also understand how you can uh, handle and understand heavy code base, with, like uh, Kiwano is an example of this. Uh, during this mentorship, I have also developed uh, an understanding and a keen interest of learning Golang and also uh, more about Git and GitHub. Uh, during this mentorship also, I uh, learned how I can write test uh, cases for various scenarios. Along with this, I learned how I can uh, meet deadlines and can handle multiple things at a time. Uh, it also helped me uh, to be a better communicator. It helped me to come out of my comfort zone and ask questions to various people and uh, clear my doubts. And it also helped me uh, in growing uh, as a uh, uh, professionally and personally also. And 
it help me uh, to uh, make me stay calm while solving any issue or uh, if i face any road, roadblocks uh, while solving any particular issue so my mentorship has been an amazing experience and one of the reason for this was my mentors uh, my mentors venkatesh kutarkar and uh, pratik pandey both are senior software engineer at nirmata they both helped me uh, really in understanding the key one of policies from uh, dropping daily updates on slack to weekly connecting meetings for uh, progress and roadblocks uh, discussion they also shared me the right resources to learn about the various key one of policies how can i understand about them and they also helped me in how i can approach a particular uh, policy and uh, solve an issue related to it along with this while uh, my exams came in between during the mentorship period so they were quite supportive and friendly regarding that also and they also helped me uh, providing career guidance i would uh, like to uh, 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 give a special gratitude to chief zola who is a technical product manager at nirmata a chief helped me in understanding the kivano policies very deeply he helped me in solving each and every doubt and helped me in merging prs uh, on the in the kivano policies repository and helped me in improving the test cases the surprises that i got from my mentorship uh, is uh, the uh, kivano uh, community support uh, they the all the community members were very helpful in making me understand the kivano policies it also helped me in uh, increasing my self confidence i also got some uh, amazing people to whom i can uh, add in my network and the last one which i never expected but my mentorship experience blog got published on the nirmata website itself so in future uh, like kivano uh, introduced me to software supply chain security so i will be exploring that in that particular field i will also uh, in planning to increase my open source involvement involvement in the cloud native world and uh, looking for more opportunities to learn and improve my knowledge so you can connect with me on uh, different social medias like on linkedin twitter and can drop me an email also and you can check my work and uh, read about my mentorship blog uh, also so thank you so much for joining hello my name is judy today i am going to talk about my experience with linux kernel contributions especially troubleshooting the kernel panic before we go any further please allow me to introduce myself my name is Jui Kang, and I'm currently working as an open source developer and have been contributing to the Linux kernel networking subsystem for years. So let's get started. When we develop with Linux kernel, sometimes the kernel panic occurs. When I was a newbie for the Linux kernel, serving the kernel panic was difficult. So instead of debugging it, I choose just to reboot my computer. Actually, it was an appropriate solution for this infinity loop. In order to get out the loop, I tried to find an effective way of troubleshooting the kernel panic. So what I'm going to show you is about step through the kernel panic debugging with example. Before we dive in, I will show you how to raise kernel panic in the easiest way. The command is pretty simple. Just write character C to proxy circuit trigger. This command raises the kernel panic like life size. But why does this command raise the kernel panic? Let's find out way. First, let's look at the kernel panic log. By skimming through the kernel panic log, we can see many details which are not familiar to us. Let me give you a brief description of how this log is constructed. At the top, the kernel panic log header is located. This provides the abstraction about the crash. 
such as the cause of the panic or version of your corner. Next is call trace. Call trace provides the context information about the crash. As you can see on the left side, call trace shows the function symbol and the function offset of the execution flow. At the bottom, you can find the register information. Register information provides the current executing dump of the CPU registers. RIP register holds the current executing instruction and code is, includes the current executing code information. So now, before we start to analyze this code trace, we need to save this panning log. In here, I've saved this as error.log. In corner, there is a script called decode stack trace. This script decodes the uh, stack trace function symbol with the source code information. So we can easily troubleshoot the kernel panic as easily look up the kernel uh, source code to figure out what caused the crash. Now, let's take a look deep dive into how kernel panic actually occurs. First, let's look what comments trigger the kernel panic. In here, the comments triggered kernel panic are pretty simple. As you can see, output redirection is used to the corner panic uh, corner profile. So what is this comment actually doing? Just write the character C to proxy circuit trigger. To figure out why this comment raised the corner panic, let's analyze with the core trace. As you can see at the right side, the core trace is reported from bottom to top. So entry this core is called first and panic is called last. Before we start, I will ignore the symbols that have a question mark. Before the symbols with question mark in core trace means that information about those tag entry is probably not reliable. So as you can see it right here, I will visualize the core trace on the right side. Although I can explain everything because I don't have enough time, so writing a file in a Linux environment involves several steps. The function on the right is color coded for each subsystems. So let's begin with our panic troubleshooting with the corner code. Here, we will uh, use the corner code version 6.2.0 RC2. Initially, a system core interface and three is core 64 after hardware frame is called. And as you can see the code on the left side, this function calls do syscore 64. Then from do syscore 64, the do syscore x64 is called. And this function calls the syscore table by passing the register as an argument. Let's take a deeper look at the syscore table. The syscore table actually is an array that consists of syscore handlers. At the second entry of this table, you can find the syscore write handler. From this handler, the cases write function is called. Back to syscore table, this will call syswrite and eventually cases write will be called. After that, case is write will call and VFS write, which is the write function from the virtual file system layer. 
And you can see from the source code, VFS write is calling the write function. As we dig deeper, we can realize that this write function is actually met with the prop leg write function. So this prop leg write function is located at prop file system. From the prop leg write function, the PDE write function will be called. And this will eventually call the prop write function. As we look deeper, we can find this probe write function is met with write CSRQ trigger, which is located at CSRQ device driver level. Moving on CSRQ trigger, we call the handle CSRQ. And from CSR, handle CSRQ, the CSRQ get key operation function will check which CSRQ command is issued. From this function, CSRQ get key operation, we check CSRQ key table data structure. Then CSRQ will finally realize that the character C is stands for CSRQ crash operation. Back to CSRQ handle, this will eventually call CSRQ crash operations handle function. At last, the CSRQ handle crash function will call Finally, this will raise a panic with panic function. So far, we will look at the how kernel panic is caused by deep dive from entry Cisco 64 after hardware frame to panic. And for the last step of analyzing the kernel panic, you can find Seedboard dashboard for additional resources. From Seedboard, you can gather various resources related to your book. With the corner panic analysis methods we have learned. So far, I was able to learn how to corner debugging in various ways. So this opportunity also gave me a chance to boost my Lean's corner contribution skills. So thanks for listening to my session. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me via the email. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my title is LFX Mentorship and me. So a bit about me. Uh, hi, I'm Sachin Moria, and I'm LFX mentee for spring term for 2022 for the Cubama project. And I'm a 2022 engineering graduate. And currently, I'm working as an associate product engineer at Enfocloud. So what is Cubama and why I selected to work on this project? So Cubama is a cloud native runtime enforcement system that restricts, that restricts the behavior such as process, file, and network operations. And it uses LSM, that is Linux security modules, uh, like SA Linux, AppArmor, and BPF LSM. Cubama has policies that we define on the Kubernetes clusters. And by using Cubama, users get rich alert and telemetry that they can use to identify malicious actors. The another question is why I selected to work on this project. So security has always been an interesting topic to me since my college days. And I used to explore and drink around how Linux works and how things work around Linux. And I also, I also learned about web security during my college days where I learned about OS top 10. And eventually when I got introduced to the Kubernetes, I started exploring projects which are related to security. And that's how I landed upon working with Kubama, which is also related to security. So now the problem. So as I already discussed, Kubama provides rich, rich alert and telemetry. So this is the image that you see on your screen is one of the alerts that we get uh, when, whenever there is an attack done on the Kubernetes cluster, having a, uh, having a brief overview, you can see that uh, it, it gives us some basic details like timestamp, uh, cluster name, cl host name, pod name, and container ID uh, of the uh, cluster. So some of the important details which we can see in the alert is the policy name that, we, that was defined by the user. And uh, the important field is the operation field. So the operation field is the field uh, where we can see it is a type process. 
So as I already discussed, Obama provides three, th three types of protection that is for process, for files, and for the network operations. So here, uh, the demo is for the, pro uh, the, the telemetry that you see is for the process type. Uh, it is of type operations. And the another field is of type resource. So when we check, uh, it, is, uh, it is pointing to the sleep binary. So the policy that was applied to the sleep, sleep, sleep binary, and whenever the malicious attacker will try to run the sleep binary on the Kubernetes cluster, it will give the permission denied to the attacker, and it will send the, this telemetry to the user that who has applied the policy to the cluster. So this is uh, one of the uh, alerts that we get on the Kubama cluster. But uh, if we consider a scenario where we are running, we are we have applied many policies to the Kuber, to the cluster, and there is an attack done on the system. So at that time, there will be a lot of telemetry that will be reached to the user, and it will get really difficult to see which one is severe and uh, need more attention than the other one, which is not just not so severe. So that's the reason we have a CLI on the cube armor, which is called as K armor. Uh, and that's a, that's a part that I worked on during my mentorship project. So we call it as K armor. And my task there was to work, uh, uh, work on adding the flag option to the current CLI that we have. And the flags that I added were this. So the first was the namespace flag that I added on the cube armor. So namespace, uh, as we can see, we have a Kubernetes cluster and uh, the, there are different namespaces that, that we, have, we can have on Kubernetes cluster. And based on the uh, requirement, there are different policies that are applied to the cluster. So if the user want to see uh, the alerts on the particular namespace, they can use this flag that I applied. The another flag was the lock flag. So uh, lock, uh, lock flag, we have of two, of two types, that is host log and container log. So, Kubama can be applied on both the system, the Kubernetes cluster as well as on the normal host system like Ubuntu. So if the if the if the policies are applied on the host system like Ubuntu, so the user if the if the attack is done on the host system, they can easily use the log filter and see the uh, alerts that are that are given by Kubama. The another uh, flag was the operation flag. So this uh, as we have three types of uh, operations on the Kubama side that is process file and network. So there are many scenarios, like if you consider a scenario where we have, we have this SQL, uh, SQL running on your system. And so we have a password file, which is already stored in your system. And we have, if you apply a Kubama policy so that it can keep a check on the, uh, if, there's, if there's no malicious at, uh, hacker who is trying to access if files or, or SQL password files, so we can create a policy for it, and if there is, if the attacker try to access this, access the poly, uh, access the files, so we can get an alert quickly, and we can also fill, we can use this operation flag, and we can easily filter it out. So the another flag was a limit flag. So this flag was a bit tricky to uh, apply, uh, and it it took quite a while for me to understand like how things work with the uh, limit flag, and uh, eventually uh, after understanding the whole flow, I was able to apply it. So the limit flag uh, is a very basic flag, which, which can be used if you want to limit the number of alerts that we, the, the user is getting. So uh, if there's an attack done on the system and there are multiple uh, different types of attacks done, so it, it gets really difficult to see uh, the number of, uh, like there will be a plethora of uh, alerts coming on your system. So the user can use this limit flag and they can specify any number of uh, flag uh, alerts they want to see. For example, if they want 20, if they want to see 20, alerts, they can specify the 20, 20 number and they can easily get 20 flag and the CLI will stop. Uh, and the last flag that I work was on the label flag uh, that we have, we are, the, the, that is very similar to the uh, kubectl label flag. We can use it uh, and we can, by using this flag, we can easily uh, get the policies based on the labels that are applied to the pods. So this were all the uh, flags that I worked during the project on. Yeah, so this is uh, so basically this was the solution that was given from my side. So about my learning, so th there were many things that I learned during this mentorship project, and some of the things that I did highlight to is uh, about GoLang. So as a project is uh, written in GoLang, so GoLang was something that I uh, I had some bit of experience with, but while working on this mentorship project, I was able to learn ins and out how GoLang works and how uh, about some of the packages like Cobra CLI that we that was that was used to build Cuba uh, KMOS CLI. I was to learn about it. 
and another thing was the grpc so i was already familiar with rest protocols but grpc was pretty new to me uh, i started exploring how it works and when i got to when i got to know about it then i was very much surprised and happy to see that how faster grpc is can compare in terms of speed when we compare it with rust uh, sorry rest uh, the another thing was ebp of the current bus bar that we have in the network namespace so uh, like ebp of uh, like there's a quote that we say if if i would like to define what the ebp of is uh, ebp of uh, what javascript is to the web ebp of is to the kernel so it becomes really uh, easy for you to program your kernel system by using ebp of code uh, I, I got introduced to it and i started exploring more about ebp of and that's how i landed upon learning selenium and i'm still co continuing to learn about the cubama and contribute to the selenium project and other than this i also learned many other soft skills like how we how to present yourself how to, to communicate with people how to do async communication and many other stuff so another thing is another uh, point is when applying so uh, there are many people who is look, who are looking to apply this uh, for the lfx mentorship project so about uh, a bit about myself uh, i was selected to this mentorship project in my third attempt so i already tried twice and i was not, not selected but in my third attempt i was selected so some of the pointers that i will like to give you when you are applying for this mentorship project is first is a community involvement so it is always good uh, if you join the slack channel of the project uh, introduce yourself and uh, start taking good first issues from the repo try to install the project on your local development and see how things work with the project the another thing is to contact mentors so it is always good to be in the eyes of mentors and let them know like you want to work as lfx mentee for this fall and uh, try att att attending community calls and show up uh, to the meeting and try to ask open question to the slack channel third point is to don't doubt yourself so uh, there are there's an imposter syndrome that everyone has so i also has this so if you, many people think i don't know stuff i i am not i will not be able to make it but i i will say just keep applying and you have nothing to lose any at, at the end of the day uh, you still have prs done and uh, you can have to show you can you can show it to your in your in your interviews and anywhere you want to use it and the last point is to learn the tech stack so it is always good if you know this stack because uh, that that's make uh, may obey way forward than other people because mentors look for the people who already knows uh, uh, the tech stack the project is based on it is not a hard requirement but still if you know this stack uh, it really gets easy for it, like it help you to get selected for the project so uh, i did like to thank both of my mentors barun and rahul they really helped me during my whole mentorship so i still remember like i was trying to set up cubama on my local system and i like cubama is a bit heavy project to run on your local system it requires a quite amount of ram so uh, at that time i was using windows and i was, was using virtual machine inside it so it was really difficult to set it up and i asked a question to on the slack channel and rahul was very impromptu who, who asked me to join a call and he can and there he helped me how i can set it up and how i, I can use dual boot and um, I could run that on a Ubuntu machine. So yeah, and Barun also helped me during my whole journey with all my small doubts, and uh, really was very helpful while working uh, on this project. So I did like to thank my both of my mentors for their help. So finally, uh, thank you. Uh, I did like to thank the whole Kubernetes community community because uh, that's where it all started. I still remember like I uh, I joined KCD Bangalore meetup where I was able to meet a lot of Kubernetes people and I they asked me to join Kubernetes in their channel where a lot of people hang out and talk about Kubernetes and uh, this is a channel where I got introduced to many people and started exploring more about Kubernetes and uh, that's how like, I think my journey started. So I did like to thank the whole Kubernetes community, Linux Foundation, CNCF, and yeah, thank you. And these are the uh, handles where you can contact me and reach out to me. Uh, once again, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's awesome presentations and thanks for sharing your experiences today with us. And thank you all the mentors without 
them, we won't be able to offer the mentorship programs as we do. We won't be able to run them. Thank you very much, um, everybody, and good luck. And, and that's the wrap. Thank you. <laughs>